to uh, speed up a bit, I, I won't uh, say too many more words, uh, and I would just ask you. Uh, the next uh, talk is uh, from Sebastian Manke about uh, what he learned, uh, uh, which tools are good working with microservices and so on. So, um, yeah, please give some warm hands to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you for being here at this late evening slot on Sunday evening, Foscon. Um, okay, my microphone also seems to work. If I'm too loud, raise your hands and I will be um, a little bit smaller. So, um, in the last years, I had the chance to work on different microservice platforms. Um, some private things, some things in company or on a customer side. Um, and I came to, in, in different platforms, to similar problems and solutions. And I say, uh, came to the idea to share some of them to you. So it's, uh, I hope it's able, you are able to follow my talk this time because I have very different topics brought together um, which are essential for me when I build up a Microsoft platform. But the topics are sometimes not so so related, so not just the Kubernetes or Swarm thing talk. So what's a microservice platform for me, or what mean microservices for me? And um, for me it's especially something of having independent components and building safe contained systems. And this is not totally clear because uh, a lot of people are also doing microservices but don't have that self-contained um, of, the, of the services in mind so much. Um, for me, it's very essential that um, I can build independent teams in a bigger project which are able to work on their component, on their service, and are able to ship their own parts without too much interfering with the other teams and services. So it ends up in a vertical architecture where the services follow the bounds of, um, of the bounding contexts, so they have a a functional responsibility and should be isolated among this functional responsibility. Of course, in this meaning, they should be loose, loosely coupled and should not be too dependent on other services. Otherwise, you, you earn nothing of, out of this infrastructure but just have a distributed system which is very complex um, if everything is, is tied together and you have too much dependencies. And the, the most essential idea, I think, is that it's not, not the way to build the components to reuse them afterwards or some, someone, uh, sometimes, but more the idea of building components to be able to delete them, to uh, replace them, and create drop-in replacements which can be um, the evolution of your platform. So this is just just um, uh, some, some points that you understand why I, I'm choosing those tools. Um, mostly when I, when I start a new platform and a new project, I have in mind such an architecture. So this is just taken out of the, the last project I was in and um, just a high level draft on how, how this looks like. So. Um, I have a platform out of multiple services. Um, in general, it's a lot more than that. So in the, the last bigger platform, we had about 50, 60 um, individual um, container images, so maybe 30 functional microservices in there. Um, but uh, in general, it's the same. You have the services. You um, mostly have an, something like an edge service for the front end, so something where your requests can come in. Um, you have the similar thing at the back end for, um, yeah, for administrative stuff. And you have a lot of integrations from external systems. And um, you have some internal services for yeah, maintaining some stuff, having some, um, some forms or things like that for uh, maybe CMS, um, something like that. And you have, I, I left out the databases. For me, the databases are from a, viewpoint um, part of the service, but um, you also have something like search clusters or different views of your data in there. And you need something to do data integration, so messaging system or so. 
Um, I will come to a lot of those points um, during the, the rest of the presentation. When you have this, um, you, you have to struggle against a lot of things. You have a lot of challenges to master. Um, I divide them in infrastructure problems and more application problems, but it's yeah, DevOps, <laughs> it's mostly both of them. Um, on the infrastructure side, um, of course, you now have a problem in, your, in a platform with distributed deployment. So you don't have to ship your one monolithic application, but you have a bunch of small services which have to be deployed. You have something to do with service discovery. So, of course, they should all be high available, high available so we have a lot of them, and they have to discover each other and load balancing and things like that. You have to do centralized logging and monitoring um, with health checks and such things. So you have to do a lot in a, on the infrastructure side to be able to maintain such a platform. And I will come in a, um, to some solutions triggering um, this point or solving this point. Um, and on the application side, you also have a lot of challenges when you want to maintain your vertical thinking and the independence of the services. One is that you came to the UI and UI is the user wants one UI, the user doesn't care about microservices, so you have an UI composition problem. Um, you have to do something like a distributed security contact with log-in management. You have now data replication, so individual services which need the same information or similar or overlapping information. And you have, of course, a huge number of small applications, so from a memory and CPU consumption point, it's a little bit different. Okay, but now this should be the, I will end up with the theoretical, theoretical parts and just show some very practical approaches to how I, my favorite solutions are towards these challenges. So um, I'm doing Docker, I guess now since two and a half or maybe three years in, in real projects and um, I started smoothly but now I'm, since a year or so, I'm very, very hard on this, on this trip. So um, for me, in a, each project, each platform, I try to Dockerize everything. So. Uh, the host has nothing, the host has a Docker daemon, um, and if possible, nothing else, and everything can be easily Dockerized. So there's no need to, to, um, to deploy something without Docker, I guess, today. Um, why? Because it's, for me, very easy to handle everything as a small microservice, even if it's a real big blob. So in one project, we had a uh, um, type of 3 CMS with a lot of gigabytes data in there, so it was a, a lot of functionality in there, so nothing like a microservice, but we put it in a Docker container and from a maintenance point, it's, yeah, it's just a service, just ship it. And um, the other part is that the requirement for the host is very minimal, so we are very easy in setting up new, new nodes and making new setups. Um, currently, Kubernetes is very popular, um, but I'm still a fan, or what, what I can't say still because Docker Swarm mode is, <laughs> is relatively new. So I'm a fan of the simple way of using Docker without all the Kubernetes overhead. Um, of course, this heavily depends on, on the project and the platform, but in my case, I mostly can come to the point where we have a lot of projects and smaller teams, not so really big, so that's not uh, that. Yeah, I like it not to have also the, the maintenance and complexity overhead of Kubernetes with me. And um, currently Docker Swarm, so we, we are using it even with the Swarm proxy mode, if somebody remembers. So since more than a year ago, it's a very buggy thing, but um, also has, does its job. Um, and the Swarm mode knows, I guess, it's, it's really good. And it's, yeah, for most use cases I have, it's really sufficient. And it's easy to develop um, for development because you can work locally with your Docker Compose and it's the same on a production system and it's very easy to deploy that, that way. Swarm gives you everything, well, not everything, but a lot which you need. Um, 
So with Swarm, you don't have to make most things complicated. It's very easy to uh, make discovery there. Um, Swarm gives you overlay networks between the nodes. You have DNS for all your containers which you deploy, and you have load balancing between the containers. So it's it's very easy. You can introduce health checks in your Docker file, and Swarm um, honors them. Um, so a small demo of Swarm setup I made. Um, before I set up some nodes on DigitalOcean, just to show you the things. Um, so registry, which we don't care about, a manager node, where the Swarm manager is, and three worker nodes. Um, but -dum, but -dum. I have a small script, so it was very easy to set up this Swarm environment. It's just one, one line of batch shell script. Of course, this is just this is not production edit, it's just a fast swarm setup without error checking or anything. So I create an initial swarm manager node with Docker machine. Um, everything against the digital ocean API with a digital ocean access token. Um, then I take a join token from the swarm master and I create um, some nodes, three nodes here, and then let the nodes join the master. So nothing more than that, just set up with Docker machine, which is very nice for, so, for smaller things. When you come to a bigger platform, um, Docker machine will not, will not um, be flexible enough if you need more network or things like that on the virtual machines. Yeah. And then um, I've launched it before, of course, because it takes some minutes to set up the virtual machines. Um, then with Docker machine, I can see all those machines. There are some, a few others here, but we see the, I can grab on digital, oops, digital ocean. Ah. So we have the master here and we have three nodes. And um, I can select now with Docker machine, Set some, set some environment variables so that my Docker commands now um, are going through the Swarm environment and not my local one. So I can now show you with node ls um, that I, Docker node ls, that I have now the, set up the, the cluster. And it's that easy, so in just few lines of shell script, I have set up the, uh, the virtual machines on DigitalOcean and created a swarm cluster. I'm not a Kubernetes expert, but I guess it's a little bit more to do to have a Kubernetes setup in most cases. <coughs> Sorry. Um, okay, I said um, swarm can do a lot of things for you, so Service, deploy services redundantly, having overlay networks, and so I have a, um, created very small uh, demo service. I call it content because it just should deliver some content over, H over HTTP. Nothing big, just a small Go script um, having two routes. One should deliver uh, an HTML, and one um, is creating the, is returning the healthy state, and I can do a post to make it unhealthy, and then it returns uh, 500. So just a very small service, which returns a little bit HTML, and I can say, okay, now you're unhealthy, and then it returns an, an error, just to demonstrate it. I've created a Docker container out of that and put it into the registry, and um, no. I can create a Docker Compose file for this basic example and to just deploy it. So um, this is a Docker Compose file with where one service is listed. It's called content. I declare the image I want to use, and then most people will, will not know from Docker Compose because it's Swarm specific. Um, I can write down some um, deployment criteria and um, 
and say give swarm the information how to deploy it. So I said replicated service, create two replicas out of this, and um, don't put it on the master or on the manager node. In general, every node in a smaller setup also could be a manager, so that I don't have to make the decision with, uh, to have a manager and worker nodes, but in this offset I have one manager and three worker nodes, so I want to separate it. And of course, I publish a pod. So how to deploy this in the Swarm cluster? There's a relatively new command, command docker stack deploy. I give this the compose file and the name. And then it creates a default network for this and creates this service. So with docker stack services, I now can list the service and see, OK, two instances are running of this, this thing. With docker ps, uh, docker stack ps, I also can, you can see um, the, the real tasks of the service. So I've now one instance on node two and node one. And as you remember, I published a port, port 80, in the Docker Compose. And this now um, brings to me the possibility to access this port. And the cool thing is I can access it on each node. So it's currently running on node one and two, so I can copy over the um, node three IP address and get the result there. So the um, exactly same port is now available on all on all nodes, even on the manager node. And um, there's a internally a virtually IP for this service and uh, independent of the, of the uh, virtual machine where I access the port, it's distributed with load balancing to the, to the right one. So um, I also created the um, DNS entry for that. Froscon io. Ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, of course, you see it here, and um, I mentioned that I can change the healthiness, so I post just da data false there. And now you see, uh, I guess I've, oh no. Well, OK, of course, I have to pick the right one. Ah, now you see it's toggling. So sometimes I pick the one. And now it's stable again. So now it has healed his, itself. Um, how does this, has this gone? Um, with Docker PS, now I see, OK, I, the formerly running service on node 1 was shut down. And there was that a new one just running 40 seconds ago, which is already healthy, or healthy again. Um, this is done by the health check in the Docker file. I've written down a health check command, which is also relatively new, and just um, had a curl command there to um, check the, the index page and. Um, give a bad feedback if there are even 500 code returns there. So Docker monitors every three seconds the swarm, monitors every three seconds the service, and if it's not healthy, it just throws it away and starts a new one. And so the load balancing fixes itself. OK. Just remove it, it's out of the way for the next example. Of course, I, in my architecture, I had the edge services for routing in and routing in from the backend side. So 
one of my biggest problems in Microsoft architectures are at the most time are, are HTTP routing things. So I have different resources here and they have to be dispatched to different services. So for example, the default one should go to a service, maybe my CMS or thing like that. And I have a block maybe or a shop subsystem or so. And I have to arrange them in an API gateway or call it edge service, however. Um, to, to make some HTTP routing there. Mm, there are different solutions out there. All of you, uh, I guess, have seen uh, reverse proxy configuration to this Apache and Nginx, so uh, nothing to show here. Um, one thing which is for me now, uh, since the time, a replacement for Nginx is the Caddy web server. It's uh, <coughs> um, relatively new, very modern uh, web server written in Golang. It, it's quite good, very extensible, and quite fast, and already very stable. Um, it has a lot of features, so for example, let's encrypt and support embedded, and um, good reverse proxy and load balancing capabilities, JWT, login and access control features, Git checkout, Hugo, static site generator, over plug-in mechanisms, and um, since it's written in Golang, and I currently prefer Golang as my first choice language, it's very extensible for me. And um, it's, uh, it's doing HTTP2 since the beginning, and also has support for HTTP push, if you like that. So it's really, really cute and modern, and a good community behind that. Um, so let's make a proxy configuration with, with um, Caddy. So, caddy compose. I have a compose file. And what I have there, I have the caddy server, the web server, it's front end proxy. I have again my Docker image with this content go application. And I have two others. I have just a vanilla WordPress here, which is not configured just to show you this block resource. And I have an Nginx, which should be, should deliver any static static things, for example, so I call it static. Um, caddy bum, ba, dum, ba, dum. It's very simple, it's just a small Docker image there. Uh, I can download it and um, write down the plugins I want to have while downloading it. Um, so nothing big here, and I have a caddy file with the configuration there. So this is then a manual configuration. There is no, not a big dynamic here in there. I've configured the, um, the domain names and the schemes, schemas. Um, as I mentioned, it is able to do automatic TL, uh, Let's Encrypt TLS. So I say, OK, my email address for Let's Encrypt is, is Manka. Um, and then I have some proxy configuration. So a proxy slash content to content, block to WordPress, block VP admin to WordPress. Um, and as a special thing, I show you the, the Git um, extension. So it's able to just um, configure a Git repository, which is then dynamically pulled from Caddy Web Service to um, directly have content from Git repository and can, you can update it and so. Um, so I pull my slide desk, which I'm using here, also into the service. And I have a second configuration for another subdomain um, for uh, with the proxy configuration to this static engine X I had in in my um, Docker Compose. So I end up with a similar setup like here. So this is the content, this is block, and some static service. Okay, so of course the command is the same, docker stack deploy. Um, oops. So it's a caddy compose and we name the stack caddy. So create some services. So now it's docker, docker stack ls shows me there is one stack with four services. And I um, can show the service. I see, okay, 
they are all fine, two of two replicas there. Um, in this configuration, I have only one replica for Caddy because the Let's Encrypt challenge for the um, automatic SSL certificate isn't working with, with load balancing. There's an alternative then, so you can do a DNS challenge, uh, which is also possible, but not, not so easy to, to show so fast. So now, you see the slide deck, which was pulled from the Git repository in, uh, from Caddy server. Um, and you also see now this is HTTP. I can now change to HTTPS and have a valid Let's Encrypt certificate here out of nothing. So not, not a lot to do there. And of course, all my routes are also working. So slash content or slash block or things like that, or even this Froscon static subdomain is pointing to the Nginx. So nothing special, just a handmade um, reverse proxy configuration. Um, in a bigger microservice architecture where I want every team to ship their code independent and the services to be independent of other components. Of course, it's not such a nice idea to maintain your reverse proxy configurations in one single component and configuration because you may end up with a lot of them and um, yet yeah, sometimes, sometimes not so nice that when you, that always when you want to deploy new services or change the routings of services that you that all service changes also require changes in your in your edge service in your single configuration. Um, then, so uh, there is uh, the idea of making this dynamic, um, and then Caddy is other way. Um, the proxy configuration also has some dynamic lookup possibilities, but I'm not using them. I've used uh, Fabio a lot. Fabio is a very um, fast and very stable reverse proxy which is able to discover the services dynamically in a console which is a service registry and then you can um, create a, or on each node you have to set up the registrator, registrator service which discovers the upcoming um, docker services and you can um, put labels there or environment variables with the past prefixes and then they end up in console and Fabio picks them up. Fabio is very cool but limited to this console approach with this, which is not so nice I think because you you then need this registrator and it's a bit yeah a bit hassle of having this infrastructure then but has done a lot of good work for me. What I prefer more now, but I don't have much experience with this, uh, but it's um, broadly used, is traffic. Um, traffic is, uh, it's traffic. Oh, sorry, I've written it. It's, it's wrong here. It's written with the K at the end. So it's a French name. Um, this is a reverse proxy with a, so very dynamic reverse proxy with a lot of backends. So, um, it's able to pull the reverse proxy configuration out of different sources. So the, f the feature set is very big. You can go to traffic IO and, um, and take a look at, on all the features. So it also has, of course, let's encrypt support for SSL, circuit breakers, and you can do a lot, lot more things with this. Um, <coughs> but even the simple use cases are simple. And it has a backend for Docker Swarm. So um, I can use it to dynamically look up the services I bring up in my Docker Swarm environment and then root them. And of course, I will show it to you. Um, bum, ba -dum, ba -dum. So first remove this caddy stack. Yeah, so this is the correct spelling of traffic. Okay, similar example, but now with traffic. In my Docker Compose, I have again this content service, I have again this WordPress service, and again 
an engine X image, which I call static here. But instead of caddy, now I have the traffic. I use the official image for that, and yeah, I give it some commands. I say, okay, yeah, please use Docker as backend and use Docker in swarm mode, not just one local Docker. I give them base domain. They say watch, so update your configuration whenever something changes. And I say, okay, please serve also your nice web UI. Then I publish some ports, so HTTP, of course, and the 8080 for the web UI. I have to deploy traffic on the manager because it needs the events from the manager of the Swarm cluster to see all the services. And um, I have to mount the Docker control socket into the, the image because yeah, traffic needs any way to uh, connect to, to Docker. Of course, I also could be able to use the HTTPS connection to Docker here. And then my services can get labels. So I'm able to give my Swarm services labels for traffic, and then traffic can scan the services which are deployed there, see the labels, and build up the configuration dynamically. And if you ever try to do this, be sure to pick the labels feature of the deploy part here. It took me sometimes an hour, because um, you can also use labels at the container level, and then it's something, something different. Um, so I label it and say, okay, my content should be um, should be published. Should, port 80 of this service should, should be used, and um, as front end rule, this should be available in this uh, under this host. For WordPress, similar, I say, okay, the same host, but only at this path prefix. and Nginx um, at a different subdomain. So I can just deploy my services, annotate them with labels, and traffic will pick them up, hopefully. Um, did, um, so we uh, again, docker stack deploy. Bam, ba -dum, ba -dum. Oops. So it seems to work. Uh, so now see, I have deployed my content to replicas, nginx, um, traffic, and it's forwarding those ports and WordPress. And now I can. Um, Go here to 8080, and there I see the traffic UI. It's really nice, so I can see the they have incoming routes and backends for that. So I can see the three incoming routes and the three backend there, and I see here the um, the individual backend services which are then used in the load balancing. So of course, or hopefully. This also works. Yeah, so I have again um, my different routes here. With traffic and now as soon as I scale something or so, I think it's Docker service scale. And my hope was that the traffic was directly able to pick it up. Ah, ah now here it is. So as you know, I have four backends for that, and traffic is now dispatching this route to all those backends. Traffic is, dis traffic is dispatching it directly to the containers. 
I guess it's not using the load balancing of the Docker Swarm cluster there, but it's doing its own load balancing and directly picking up the individual services. Okay, back to the presentation. <coughs> so these are my solutions for, for dynamic routing, which I think is very fine because you don't have to change your infrastructure whenever you change something on a service. Um, next challenge. Next challenge is logging. Um, I guess most of you have um, already heard something about Elasticsearch, Logstash Kibana, or things like that. Um, I guess it's really important to invest on a good logging infrastructure with a distributed microservice platform. Um, I don't like Logstash, and last time I tend to use FluentD. It's a little bit better. I'm not not happy with, with even with FluentD. I guess it's also not not so nice. It would be better to have a log shipper so that you can use Docker local, uh, Docker local logging and then ship afterwards. Um, but it's okay for the most cases. Um, but the thing I want to mention here is the way how I prefer to log, um, because I think text logging is something from the 80s. I'm also something from the 80s, so it's, all, it's still okay. But um, I can, think we can do better. And um, so I try to uh, use structured logging where, wherever possible. And um, yeah, give them some semantic and make a good log convention. So um, uh, all services um, should write to standard out and standard error. And this should be, in the best case, um, um, JSON records. And we have in our project some um, logging conventions which they should follow. So for example, every service should do access logging. And we have a fixed scheme for that. And application logs should be look similar. And call logs, so for outgoing calls, so the opposite of the access log, or lifecycle events or so. Just show you some of them. Application log may look this way, so um, fixed set of how the levels should are described, um, type, it's an application log, and then a fixed set of attributes there, so a good logging convention. Um, we always try to use correlation IDs so that when an incoming request splits up to all the services, you are able to trace it in the services. So the simple thing is to have a, create a correlation ID in an outermost service and dispatch it with the, or give it with the headers to the uh, next services so that you are able to filter an H, outgoing HTTP or uh, incoming HTTP request by its correlation ID then. Um, and each service is able to, on the logging to um, introduce different fields, maybe user ID or things like that. <coughs> um, access log looks similar, but of course has some HTTP terms in there. Um, so in the method or things like that, for example. And the call log, very important in the call log. Um, also, of course, having a correlation ID and the duration. So then you are able to very easily figure out which are my cost, cost expense of microservices, why is this browser call taking two seconds, um, which of those maybe 20 services involved, hopefully not 20, but five or 10 services involved is calling this. And what I like very much are uh, lifecycle logs. Um, so that every service reports um, with a lifecycle event I was started, or I was failing, I'm, or somebody give me a quit signal, and I'm terminating now, things like that. Um, some years before, I thought everything um, for, for monitoring should be, should be metrics and health resources and things like that, but um, for me, it turns out that it's sometimes, with Prometheus, it's, it's, a little, it's okay, but it's sometimes a little bit too, too complex to really get that data and and um, work with that data. So I also tend the way to, to um, report metrics in the logging events and then do statistics over Kibana or so. OK, this more were the part on the um, infrastructure thing. Um, 
Next thing um, is on the, on the application part. The infrastructure helps us already to avoid a monolith a little bit, but um, we can do, do better in some part and have different sh additional challenges there. Um, yeah, I want to repeat just a few slides of a talk I had done um, years before here at Foscon. It was about vertical thinking, just that you know why I choose this technical solution. Um, I come, I'll come to soon. So when I have a classical application approach, I had this three-tier application. Wow, very guy, uh, very cool. Um, from the 90s, I guess, or last last card. Um, then we came to the SOA idea. Wow, cool. Let's make services. We had services already in SOA. So um, make the services smaller. Give them maybe their own data. Then make business. So persistent service, then make business service, all of that. But the most time, the thinking in the ZOA times also was, okay, and then at the end, create one big application in front of that, or one monolithic UI, and just use those services. So um, the world was only a little bit better. Um, for me, and this is a way of thinking, but um, I guess there are a lot of people which have the same mindset. Um, the essential thing in a microservice way is to have self-contained services and vertical thinking from the database up to the front end. So microservice should be, it may consist um, out of some services even, but um, there should not be a layer which already bundles everything together. I didn't want that with the edge service, and I don't want to have this bundling again in the UI. Of course, there are a lot of use cases where you have a mobile application or so, which, where it's, again, possible because a applic mobile application is a monolith and then you consume the services, so then you're in an easy world. Or if you create a single page application, which is also suitable for a lot of use cases, then you're also, again, in most times with the monolithic UI. Um, but in the, in the web, you still have the chance and still have the big worth, I guess, to, to deliver server-side rendered pages, which are at least pre-rendered and then at the dynamic um, parts and content. And I believe that in a microservice world, at best, every service delivers its own UI. But of course, when every service delivers the, its own UI, the user wants to have the, it's one UI, so I need some, some glue, something to put everything together. And um, I think in the last project, um, we, we found a good approach on that um, and um, created a library, I will show you, um, which is able to do such a UI composition. And the goal is to have different components where each component just delivers a fragment from the thinking point. Just a fragment of HTML so that you can build it up together. It was the idea with portals 10 years ago and I guess we, everybody here who has done portals is, hates it. But um, <laughs> of course the need of having different modules and bring the things together is, is, a, is a need. Uh, so it uh, was natural that the solutions came up there. and this. All of this browser and UI component, front end, JavaScript component stuff we think currently is, is also the same need. Um, and we tried to solve it on, a, on the server side um, this way, and we have created a library. It's also open source, Golang library. Um, it's called libcompose, and it's a uh, library which is able to do this simple aggregation. The idea is that um, each service, um, uh, maybe here it's said the best, that each service delivers its own fragments, but um, HTML fragments are nothing nice. You can't view them in the browser. So if you just put the fragment part in the browser and you need scripts and title tag and things like that. So we came up with the idea, and not only we came up, um, so some came up with the idea that each service 
to just deliver a fully valid HTML where the fragments it delivers are filled. So um, we created this libcompose which is able to pass some, like a template engine to spa, ta, pass some special HTML directives so that um, fragment composition can be done there. Then the libcompose or the, each, the libcompose is able to fetch the HTMLs from all the services in parallel. One is declared at the layout master and then it can do the, the aggregation and templating there and um, can take care of scripts or deduplication of ti or title tags or so to put them in a head from all the things and do deduplication there, things like that. So just to show you a small example, um, one service may deliver a layout HTML and this is just the usual HTML file but has this um, include directives the libcompose is able to um, understand and other services may deliver these fragments which are referenced here so for example um, I have an include of um, of content subheader and content here and another service may deliver this HTML with the content um, where um, the body is taken for the content but the additional fragments, maybe the subheader or so, are declared. So and with this way I have this generic composition library there. Each service is able to produce HTML and I can simply develop the service because I can see the fragments and I can get through it and test it individually and then I could put it together and this lib composer is able to fetch the things and make one big, big um, HTML out of this. One very, very nice thing in this approach for server-side rendering is that we introduced um, fragment-based caching in the lib compose. So, um, when you try to do caching, you uh, on the server side, you always hit the problem with personalization. So you, in general, want maybe want to cache a layout, you want to cache the navigation, you want to cache a content part out of all small, uh, slow CMSs or so, but you have some parts which are user specific. So the shopping basket icon with a number of um, items in there also, and um, they are not cacheable. So in a classic approach, you have a problem to to do partially caching there. And um, with this approach we can, in the libcompose, introduce um, fragment-based caching so that those parts which are generic on the fragment side can be come out of the cache and only the um, user-specific things has to be fetched on, on its request. Okay, this was libcompose. Um, the documentation is not so nice. There is is a lot, but I'm not sure if it's so understandable if somebody is interested in it and wants to take a look on it. Um, I'm very motivated to, to help out there and um, to bring this forward if somebody is interested in it. Um, yes, um, Zalando has, an, has a similar approach. They call it Taylor. Um, it's also a, a component which may wasn't that the fit wasn't so perfect for us, but it's very similar. So if you like, pick this up, for example. Next thing is authentication. Um, next and last topic is authentication. In this distributed environment, you always come to the point where you need a user, where you need to log in, and all the services have to share this login and the security or identity context. and. Um, for me, the, the time of sessions is very over. Sessions, server-side sessions, classical thinking is, is nothing good, I think. Um, it has some, some drawbacks because you have server-side state. Um, you have dependencies between services because maybe one service is owner of the session, so the, the most infrastructures or architectures with the session which split up tend to become a session service, so one service where all the other services have a dependency to to fetch the session data or so. 
So it's um, not easy to model that that nice with fashion, I guess. The solution for me is JWT, or in general, crypto tokens. So um, create a cryptographic, cryptographically token and push it to the uh, um, browser. Um, JWT is a RFC standard where you have a JSON payload and um, give it a signature and base, uh, not cryptid, but um, um, encode base 64 and put it maybe in a cookie or uh, with a single page app um, provided as a header. And um, <coughs> there are a lot of implementations out there, so you can pick some, uh, different, uh, different implementation libraries for every programming language I, I, I know. Um, and you have the choice of symmetric or asymmetric um, signature algorithms. So you're very flexible with this. So the JWT approach is that you have one service which is creating the JWT, you give it to the client, and then the client can make calls to the server and each service can get this JWT token and because it's signed, it can validate the signature and now on its own if this token is trustable and if the, the content of the token is valid without an additional call to central session service or things like that. So you have a perfectly loose coupling mechanism of, of login. Um, because I came to the point where I implemented similar ways of using crypto token or JWT in special in different projects, I said, okay, this, this was the last time, now I create a project out of this. And um, <clears throat> I started an open source project, LoginSurf, and it is um, already a little bit used, so I already have some stars and 4,000 um, Docker registry pulls, so it, and as you see, already some contributors there, so it's, it's really, really used. And um, LoginSurf is a small microservice, which is just doing the login. So it's a standalone service, very, very limited, very minimal, um, where you just can have a login form or uh, for REST API, for REST service, uh, REST client um, endpoint there, and you just can do the login, and then you get the JWT token. It's available as standalone microservice, um, Docker container, I can use it as Golang library, or even as Caddy plugin. So I showed Caddy the web server earlier and um, I had made an official plugin out of this so um, you can directly use it in Caddy so that you have a login form there then, and you can use the, it's playing nice together with the Caddy JWT plugin which was already available there and then you can in Caddy secure your path is, um, based on criteria in the JSON payload. And login surf, um, of course you have to do the login against something, um, has um, a structure for plugin backends, um, there's an HTTP, an HT password file plugin, um, OSIAM is an identity management we have open sourcely developed in Tarrant, you can use, um, there's a simple configuration you just can provide them, HTTP upstream is, was a contribution where you can just forward the authorization as HTTP, HT access to another location, and um, recently I introduced the OAuth support for GitHub and got the contribution for Google OAuth support. So um, I will show you in a demo. Um, we have still this traffic stack in our Docker Swarm. Um, so I now can launch my login microservice. So I use the Terran login surf image and provide it. So if you, this is a little bit unsecure. If you remember this, you have maybe 20 minutes time until I leave, delete the keys here <laughs> after the talk. Um, so I provide login surf with the simple plugin to say, okay, there's a user Bob with password secret and I um, give it the GitHub OAuth credentials for the GitHub API to do a login in this direction. And as we saw earlier with the other uh, services, 
I have the traffic annotation, so um, that should be picked up from traffic then. And um, I declare the network here because each compose file defines by default its own network, and I want to join, have it joining the traffic network, which was defined earlier, so it should join this. So docker stack deploy. So now I have this stack also. Let's see the traffic UI. Hmm, it's not picking it up. Ah, no, it is. So um, here, the third one is now the, the login service picked up from traffic. So now it should be possible to, to go to slash login. And yeah, now I see my login form. And I can say, OK, I'm um, Bob Secret. Yeah, that seems to work. Yeah, welcome, Bob. I can log out, and I also can go to GitHub and say, OK, yeah, please authorize. Bum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Back again. So this was taken, the data was taken from GitHub then. So I also have that. And if I want to say, OK, let's, let's add Google also, I can just give it the, the Google. I was too lazy to set up it correctly. So now you see I also would have been uh, able to use the Google login. Uh, so this is a good, um, uh, good Microsoft because it's very clear to, to say what the responsibility of this service is. <laughs> Sometimes not so easy with Microsoft, I guess. Okay, oh, I thought it was the last topic. But I think um, I will skip this one because there are some slides and it's or on, on your convenience. I would skip it, but if you like to see hear, hear something about Kafka and data integration also, I can talk about it. OK. Yeah. <laughs> so um, as I showed here, I always have the data integration problem. Because when I have this vertical thinking, each microservice should have its own data. And I don't want to have two services with this connection to the same database. And I don't want to have one service calling another, because then it's runtime dependent on the other service. Of course, it's able, uh, uh, possible to say, yeah, I'm hardliner on this. Or you also can say, yeah, sometimes I go this way, and sometimes I say, OK, I don't care about cross dependencies there. But in the way that you want to have independent data, you have a replication problem. Because maybe every service needs to know about the user. Or if you are in a shopping environment, there are some services which need to have the product data there. So maybe the shopping cart and the product search overview or things like that. And therefore, Kafka is a very nice solution. Kafka is a... Uh, dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. Kafka is a Apache project which is widely used. Um, it's a distributed streaming platform. Um, so you can think of it like a, like a messaging bus, but a messaging bus normally has the idea of doing day going, uh, putting a message into the bus and someone is taking the message and then it's out of the bus. Kafka has the idea of a more database-centric idea. So you put messages in there and they stay there forever, just in mind. Of course, you can with retention time or so or delete all the data there. So in Kafka, you have a topic. A topic can have partitions, which are able to split them and chart them over a cluster. So you, it's highly fault tolerant. And um, a Kafka, con Kafka consumer can store its offset and then read in this message log. 
And Kafka also gives possibilities to um, store the, the read offset of the consumers so that um, you can easily have a replication log there where multiple consumers have a read offset and can fetch the data then there. It's, the thinking is relatively equal to, um, to an SQL um, database log, which is also used for database replication or so, where all events are just written down and others come up and take them. And um, Kafka is very good in the clustered and failover scenarios, so you can have a Kafka cluster with multiple servers and um, topic with multiple positions, charted over the servers with rep rep uh, replicas, and then you also on a client side can create multiple servers on different nodes, which um, as a consumer group can pull out the data there. And Kafka takes care, and the consumer group logic takes care that each message is taken by a service, and when, a, when one service is going down, other services take over the responsibility to fetch the partition, partitions of this service. Because without something like Kafka, you always are in a synchronization problem that um, when you have multiple clients fetching out the data that um, only one should handle the message or so, and you have to, have to handle this. And um, yeah, we are using Kafka in, in some projects because it's, uh, and a lot of architectures uh, and, and companies are doing this because it's a very, very nice way to, and robust way to have a, a data decoupling of all the services you have and the replication of the essential data. Also, this, in this context, if you're interested in this, this the buzzword CQ, CQRS is um, very, very common currently, where you just think event-driven, just saw the events, and are able to restore all the state and the components based on that. Okay, this was Kafka in three minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. My slides are available at GitHub, so um, I have a talks repository that you can the slides also the this is generated oops oops not so okay the slides are online here I guess when it's loading then they're there and I guess the link oh no that isn't that nice but I have a talk repository and um, this is markdown so you can find everything here and also the examples are completely there yeah, thank you for your attention at the time. Do you have questions? Yeah, yeah late Sunday evening. <laughs> okay, then I thank you for your attention. <laughs>